What's up? Welcome to a new episode of Movie Schmovie. This is episode number 397. My name is Steve. I'm one of the co-hosts of the show. And as always, I'm joined by... Ron. My ninja women exist to serve our master's will. <laughs> oh, you can always John. count on John to go with some sort of intro to required viewing on the, uh, <laughs> I like and, it. Uh, and the rollout theme. of his name. And, yeah, and I like if, it. if I don't do that, it means there... <sighs> It's. I don't know what kind of comment that is on required viewing. It means that there were no good lines from it. Yeah, this movie had a million great lines. <laughs> it did. And I'm to understand, probably half of them have have been sampled uh, by RZA, right? Yeah. Or was he the one, or was it just? Yep, yeah. yeah, RZA, RZA, yeah, RZA made the saying. beats. RZA made the beats. Um, but yes, three ninety seven. We're creeping up on that four hundred. That's exciting. Yeah, not too far. Not too far. Um. Kind of tease a little bit here, but uh, we're, we're going to, if you listen to last week, it's not a tease because you know, but if you skipped an episode, this uh, week's required viewing, Ronald shows Shogun Assassin. Uh, that's what we were just kind of briefly joking about there, but uh, we're going to talk about that in a moment. And also, if you listen to last week, you know that we had planned on trying to see the Iron Claw this week and uh, through a series of unfortunate events, very unfortunate. Not by the hands of Lemony Snicket. Uh, yeah. We struck out and nobody saw the Iron Claw oh, this wow. week. So we will not be able to review it. Uh, maybe later in the pod, another episode, hopefully. <clears throat> so instead, we're going to talk about Sam Esmail's uh, Netflix thriller, uh, Leave the World Behind, which came out last week as well. Um, so we'll talk about that, probably as the main review, and then a couple other bits and bobs towards the end so uh let's start with required viewing ron you want to take it away yes so um my pick was the martial arts classic shogun assassin which is an amalgamation of uh two martial arts films uh but it's 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 pretty unique because it is american dubbing and i don't know if there's any version of this that is in in its native uh i think it's in chinese um i don't know if there's a i don't know if there's a version of it isn't it japanese maybe it's japanese but but mine has chinese you know what that 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 doesn't mean that it's it's chinese (laughs) let's say japanese um but i think what what makes it unique is that it, it is only in America. I think it's an American movie. I, I I've never I haven't seen this put anywhere else but the American market. Uh, Shogun. It's, it's I think I think I looked into this too, Ronald, because when you described it, yeah. I was like, what? You know, when you when you <laughs> when you set it up, and yeah. then when I was looking for this movie to watch, um, I ended up watching it on the Plex. So thank you for that. Okay. But um, no but when I was looking for it to watch to make sure I was watching the right thing, there obviously was a lot of stuff that came up that was adjacent to this. Yeah. But also, it was very clear I'd found the right one when it said. Because you'd said it's like two movies edited together. So yeah. my impression is it's two Japanese films that were edited together by an American director, uh, Robert Houston. Yeah. yeah Robert Houston. Yeah. And that this form of it takes a, a maybe most of its runtime comes from the second film yeah. in the series, in the Japanese series. There's six films in the Japanese series. Most of the stuff comes from the second film. There's about maybe about 10 or 15 minutes that comes from the original film. So in that sense, I think the sort of flashbacky stuff, the sort of past, the setup stuff, yeah. that's truncated into about 10 or 15 minutes of this movie. And then the rest of this movie is essentially a slightly abridged version of of the of the sequel. I think yeah. that makes sense in a way to get through the backstory that way. I, I, I was sort of tempted... To maybe try to watch both of them, but then at the end of this I movie, I was like, I don't know that I'm that tempted, but maybe I'll, I'm tempted to watch forward to catch uh, the yeah. next couple of films in the series just to see what's up with it. But yeah. I, I love this idea of uh, you know it's a it's based on a comic on a on a manga um, that was uh, um, you know a very influential. And I remember when I was coming into comics, the comics just aren't for kids anymore, uh, aren't just for kids anymore kind of era of comics, um, the kind of post Dark Knight Returns era and Watchmen and all that stuff. In yeah. that in that few years, in the mid to late 80s, there was a lot of stuff getting reprinted and mm. there was a pretty nice reprint series of the Lone Wolf and Cub books. And I know I bought 
maybe four or five issues of that. Uh, oh, and I cool. thought I was looking for them to, to flip through before this episode, but I couldn't find them. I hope I still have them. But, you know, the artwork was really beautiful. And there were some moments in the film that I that were that struck me, particularly images of the little boy. Um, they're just straight from the comic that looks almost exactly like illustrations. Oh, that's from, really cool. From the comic. So in that sense, I, I think it's interesting to note that this was a franchise film based on a comic book. Uh, the, uh, as well as what we've been watching in recent years, but this was the sort of Japanese 1971 version of that, which is yes. you know a totally different kind of story, but a similar sort of oh, this is the populist movie based on on a popular comic because you know comics of course have a, a cultural profile in Japan that's like yeah a little pretty higher big, pretty than, huge than well, it is in the states yeah, so, yeah. anyway so that's all very interesting <clears throat> yeah so the basic plot is um the father is an assassin for the shogun the shogun is a crazed man who becomes very paranoid and essentially because the shogun assassin is so powerful goes to assassinate the shogun uh the shogun ronald you didn't mention his job title do you want to mention his job title <laughs> yeah the shogun assassin no, it's a oh, his assassin. He's his decapitator. The, oh, the decapitator. He, <laughs> he's the shogun's. Job. He's the shogun's decapitator. Yes. The shogun, while being charged with paranoia, sends his goons to kill the shogun. Yeah, and kills the mom instead. And what a mix-up! What a, what what an awful mix-up! I mean, I'm not laughing at that, but obviously, no. it's just the way that it it's it's a little loopy. Yeah. And then the father is driven in this crazed rage. He's like, I'm going to kill everybody that even thought about me. I mean, because he really does kill everybody that even had his 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 thought, the thoughts of the Shogun assassin in his head. But he forces his son, right as a child, to choose between a sword and a ball. I mean, when he, when he can't even comprehend this, mm -hmm. and obviously the kid chooses a sword, and they go on this really cool journey, and I think it hit me a little harder, maybe because, you know, dad stuff, seeing a father being so committed to protecting his son was really fun to watch. Um, but he's he had zero challenges in this movie. It, it should be called Shogun Undefeated. It, he just did. He, he didn't take a piece of an L like he he got slashed maybe once. Yeah. But everybody else, he he he, he made quick work of. Well, he, he he got wounded enough to almost bleed to death midway into the movie. But you're right. That doesn't happen at the hands of any particular person. <laughs> right. That right, kind of right. is like after a fight. We It's one of those things where the, the warrior is revealed to have an injury. And I thought it was that was an interest like with the blood dripping down his, his arm mm -hmm. when they were walking. I thought that was a good reveal of that. Um, but you're right. He's sort of uh, what are the, what are we, you know, he's a Mary Sue uh, Shogun assassin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's um, he's hyper competent. He's uh, uh, um you know, whatever you call that plot armor, you know, whatever thing it is, but like, yes, he's definitely yeah. the guy who, who John Wick, you can't, you can't yes. beat him going up against him means you're going to die and he will kill you. Like, there's not a lot of like, well, you seem like a nice guy. I'll let you live sort of shit. Yeah. It's like yeah. fight them all until they're all dead. Um, it women, was... women, not children, but women and men uh, on the road. Yeah. If you ever, he, if he, I, I like the little imagery of him kind of subtly sort of clicking his, his blade out of, out of the sheath. Um, I'm sure yeah. I'm using the wrong words for uh, uh, for his type of weapon, but um, that that was a cool way to reveal that he was like at the ready, kind of as a warning sometimes, but also to let us yeah, know yeah, yeah. he's ready to, yeah, to he's ready do to the next step, which is the clean sweep of the blade out of the scabbard. I just finished you know, watching a couple episodes of Blue Eyed Samurai, and I, I I'm sorry, Blue Eye Samurai. I keep saying eyed. Um, the similarities between those two shows, just just in sort of the scale of it and the type of enemies there are. And I think there's literally like a three person team after the, after her in this story, which is really cool. Yeah. So I guess what I'm wondering is, what did you guys think of Shogun Assassin? Steve, you've been kind of quiet. Yeah, no, I mean, th this is, I mean, admittedly, this is like a genre that I don't really kind of gravitate towards, okay. <clears throat> excuse me, normally, but obviously I'm aware of, and I, I think a lot of them, you know, a, a lot of action films that I love pay a lot of uh, respect or kudos or attention. You know, that you can tell that it's been an inspiration. Um, mm -hmm. th this one specifically, I feel like I don't really have any reference to except for, excuse me, except for um, I just remember I just remember BB saying she wanted to watch it and kill Bill, too. Uh, <laughs> when, when she's laying down with her at night and like she's like, what do you want to put on? And she says, Shogun Assassin. And Bill says it's too long. 
Like that, that, that's the, that when you said it last week, like that's my reference point. Wow. That's really not cool. the backstory of, you know, and, and I think you even maybe mentioned at some point, maybe it wasn't in reference to Shogun Assassin, but maybe another movie that we talked about prior. It may have even been John's pickup last week, but like you mentioned like Tarantino, like kind of, you know, redoing a lot of these movies and you can tell like what an impact or what an influence, <clears throat> like the one that we watched last week, um, Dead of Night or, or even this specifically. But yeah, that's all I could think about while watching it was like, you know, the movies that you could tell, um, you know, it it's it, it had an impact on. So, I mean, that's what was running through my mind the whole time. I mean, the whole Lone Wolf and Cub uh, approach to storytelling and, and the series that John mentioned, like the six films, I, I was reading up on this after watching it a little bit, too. But like, you know, just that story, <clears throat> that narrative, you know, you see how many times that gets put into a movie yeah a tv series like last of us you know like all these things very very yeah. modern things that are huge hits and it's because the story is just so good i mean like it really is so easy to connect with and follow yes um, but yeah and like you latch on to like the emotional piece so quickly in a movie that is so visceral and you know graphic and like just blood splurting out of a decapitated body yeah. you know <laughs> Yeah. like but you haven't but mentioned yet, the gorg but, you, we yeah. do have to talk about it this is yeah, yeah, yeah i'm saying like but like that's the balance of it you know you're like wow like this is like this is fucking extreme <laughs> yet yet you're like yet he's kind of just like rolling with this kid trying to protect this kid yeah and you're just like that's that's really the, the quote-unquote heart of it all but i mean it was super super fun i mean like super entertaining um the a lot of the fight stuff was awesome um I just was like immediately again, admittedly not watching a ton of films like this. Um, you know, like how graphic and gory it so was. Graphic. Like cutting through that straw hat and like the fucking sword going like halfway through his skull, yeah. and pulling it out. And like and like John kind of just mentioned, like, even when he kind of has like his sword at the ready, like you hear it unclick. There's a couple sequences like where you can hear him, like, you know, when he finishes the group off that he just took down. He kind of goes through that motion where he puts it in, but it doesn't click in. And he like, yeah. it's like a there's like a there's like a pregnant beat yeah. that he just waits yeah. and then you hear it click. Yeah. And I was like, man, that's like a fucking that's just it was so slick. Like that was so cool. I, I really enjoyed the scene where the 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 warriors that were supposed to like kill him are like, We're not gonna fight you. Yeah. Let us leave. Right. And then I'll be back at some point to kill you. I love that part. And then he just breaks the, the it's like, yeah, it's yeah. just like really it's cool. cool. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very, it's very and I think like and I think that's probably why like the impact, like you know, of all you know, in, in hip hop and other films, like all yeah. what you talked about last week and even just now. I think just that that's the that's the the entry point is that it, it's just really cool. Yeah. Like, it's just a really cool movie. Um, and you could see why, like, people from all different aspects of art and creatives and anything like that would latch onto it, even if it's not like, you know, somebody could, like, you know, criticize certain parts of the movie for whatever reason they'd want. But, like, there's just something there, I feel, for, like, so many different kinds of moviegoers. And, again, like, creatives, artists, there's, there's a lot of cool, quote-unquote, cool stuff to, like, really kind of just gravitate towards. Yeah. And it's and it's 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 like such an easy movie to it's it's a quick watch too. I felt right. like it was yeah. like really easy to watch. Right, yeah, like yeah, what it's like ninety minutes or something. Yeah, it's, it's flew by, dude. Yeah. Um, you know, I just wanted to say like, what about the guy when um when he goes to the ninja queen or whatever and is like, well, I'm gonna use your warriors to fight this guy, and she's like, S -s who's your best guy? And 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 they they cut him like her her ninja women. Uh, they cut that guy up so like you see like the blade goes and then you see like yeah. half of a face fall and hit yeah. the ground. <laughs> yeah. I mean that's the kind of thing you're talking about. This sudden violence. I was shocked by that. I was thinking like John Carpenter had to see this movie. Uh, oh, Sam, Sam Raimi <laughs> had to see this movie. You know, like there were multiple sequences. I I kept thinking. I mean, just visually, I kept thinking of like the way like the visuals of some of like Big Trouble in Little China. Totally. Yes, like totally. a lot of that. I mean, yeah. that movie almost had to directly be referring to the, the guy with the big, the big straw hats because For I've sure. seen that image recycled in pop culture. There was a comic book character that used that design. And it never occurred to me that that was like, I thought it was a, I always thought it was someone exaggerating yeah. something that like, someone yeah, wore like on their head in a movie. Yeah. Yeah. But like, in fact, this movie kind of plays it. And it's kind of what you're saying, Steve. There's this cool style. Like, anytime you think the movie's up its own ass and kind of a little serious about like what a badass this guy is, yeah. um, it has this weird, there's a visual 
interest or, or humor or or lightness almost to it it almost yeah. feels like an adventure at mean, times yeah. yeah um and then at other times it then it feels really grim and really serious and it's full of death and you know it's all about the little boy sort of kind of what you said steve kind of maintaining that innocence but those uh death uh masters of death i guess is what they were called the ones with the the sort of straw hats they, they we see more of them early on and then they kind of get winnowed down um isn't that aren't they, aren't there more of them earlier or were there always only three of those guys I think there were more. I think there were five, maybe. I think I feel like there were five. But when they're like moving over the sand together in kind of yeah, formation, I love it's just it. it's just really cool choreographed imagery that's like, you know, almost at odds with it with the sort of other side of this, which is the kind of gritty, uh, like you said, kind of an arty look mixed in with a very pulpy style, a B movie almost style of this. So yeah, it was very interesting to see, and I could totally see why it becomes part of the lore of a lore heavy hip hop group, uh, uh, yeah. you know, and I think that's really cool. I, you know, the, speaking of the masters of death, that there were two deaths at the end that I just, you know, you know, how I like to write down lines, but there was this one, one of the guys dies and he's like hurt. And he says, uh, I mean, actually like, it seems like his feelings are oh. hurt. He says, <laughs> how could you throw your sword? And not, not like, how did oh, you yeah. do it? But almost like, how dare you? Like, how could you throw your sword? And then he rolls down the sand dune and dies. And then the one guy has an internal monologue that we hear as he dies after getting his throat cut. And I'm just going to you know, share this with you guys. When cut across the neck, a sound like wailing winter winds is heard, they say. I'd always hope to cut someone like that someday to hear that sound. But to have it happen to my own neck is ridiculous. <laughs> I feel like I'm closing my eyes and like the way you just read that. I, I want to hear hear Will Forte read that. <laughs> oh, totally. Oh, he would be he would be good if you It'd recast that with him. No, but the cultural stuff. Ridiculous. Right. Yeah, but it's the way he, you just don't think that sentence is going to end that way, you know? To, yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Blah, blah. Ridiculous. But this is a movie that has unexpected kind of comic moments in mixed in with the the gore and it makes me think about how like <laughs> Again, it's another cultural thing that like this yeah. is a tradition that goes way back. It's based on a story that, that had a cultural uh, footprint already for, for, you know, when this came out in Japan. And, and and it goes it's part of a tradition. And it's almost kind of like an amped up version. I haven't been able to find out how much this movie was really one of the first ones to be that gory. But I do think that was one of the things people noted about it when it came out was that it was almost seen as kind of offensive because of how... Um, how gory it was. And I will say this movie, even though I think you can categorize the scene as very innocent um, in its own weird way, this I think this movie has a contender for the most awkward scene we've ever watched for the show. The scene where they come in and they're all in the wet clothes and he like makes sure everybody strips off their clothes. I think he's like searching the <laughs> the, the ninja woman for, uh, for um, like weapons, but he also yeah. basically just makes her think he's going to, uh, a, you know, Assault sexually attack her, yeah, her. Yeah. and then he rips her clothes off, and then he they all huddle in close together to, for warmth. He then says, "We got to stay warm," which is like, okay, you could have said that before <laughs> you sort of rip people's clothes off. But then the little boy starts just kind of hitting the woman's boob while they're like yeah. huddled in together, and it like aw awakens some slightly maternal urge that she, instead of trying to kill uh, our our hero, she kind of you know relaxes into the sort of family vibe of what they're doing, and then they leave her behind pretty quick. I don't know. I just thought that was an extremely strange scene. And I didn't know when when you're watching one of these movies, we've talked about this when you've picked the movie. How did it feel watching a scene like that, Ronald, thinking like, I hope this scene like I hope this scene goes the innocent route and not the seemingly weird route. It could I, be. <laughs> I did not want her him to assault her at that scene. I was like, man, this is like getting weird. I Yeah, because it was out of nowhere. It was like right. he acted like he didn't have like a sexual bone in his body. And then he's like, I'm going to assault this woman right now. It's just like. But it's more like the movie was almost making a weird gag out of yeah, it, which is to yeah, say sure. he's just he's just searching her for weapons, yeah. but he's not going to explain that to her. And she's just afraid of him. So she's pulling away. And so that's where his like roughness comes from. Not great, but it's like un understandable that she's sort of been an enemy of his and he's checking to make sure she's not trying to kill him, yeah. which later she is trying to kill him. So he had a good reason to think, like, let's check. But the fact that he doesn't explain it is weird. And then the fact that the movie wants you to think maybe he's about, like even the camera angles and stuff in that moment get really weird. And then the fact that there's a naked kid in the room while this is happening, I don't know. It was just a very strange, very <laughs> strange scene. Um, most of the rest of it, I would say, aged a little bit better in terms of what Steve was talking about, just the kind of coolness factor of this yeah. of this movie. But I, I really feel like, like I, I satisfied a curiosity I've had for a while about this this film or this series, you know. Um, so like, I, I do think I'll come back and watch a couple more at some point just to see what happens next. I, I wanted to say one more thing and it's like, it's a small thing, but it really stood out to me was like, there's a specific, uh, like I think the sequence is like, the, they're like fighting on that waterfall 
And like yeah. he jumps down below the waterfall and they follow one another and the, and the camera kind of pans out. So you can yeah. like basically see the entire like river and the what it's like a little thing like that, that like, you know, a, a sequence like that, where a lot of filmmaking, especially more modern filmmaking, like you would be up in their faces, you'd be up yeah. like tight in the swords and like in the fight. You, you And that's what a lot of people would probably criticize. Like you get lost in some of the fight choreography when you're inside of it so deep. Mm -hmm. But I thought it was really cool. Like, you know, it's, there was a few sequences like that. And that may be that may be like a thing with a lot of these films. I can't speak to because, again, I haven't seen a ton. Maybe, Ronald, you could. But. I, I really liked that a lot. Like, you know, there was a few moments in this in this one where like instead of getting like tighter in the fight, you kind of step back from the yeah. fight so that you can like see what's really happening. Like, you know, you really aren't getting like, you know, uh kind of like like the, the choreography is happening it totally in the frame. Like you're not yeah. being like tricked movie wise, like with like what is being done by someone else, like out of the shot, you know, in terms of coverage. But like, you know, that one stood out to me because like when he jumps down and the next one jumps down, like there's not a cut, you know, yeah. nothing turns yeah. around or like or shifts per or shifts coverage or anything like that. Like it's just right there. They both jump down. They just fucking start fighting again. And it just keeps going. And it, it like little things like that. I really appreciate, which is why, like, I feel like when that stuff happens now in movies that we watch. Um, like, you know, thinking of things like John Wick or like more recent mo modern action, like hits that, or, or like, you know, well-received, you really respond to that stuff because like, it feels new, but it's not really new. It's just right. that they've kind of gone back to stuff that was in this case, look like done like 40 plus years ago, but like, just, you know, the way stuff is shot now, it's a little more of a flex to be up inside of something where I don't know in some ways like backing up and watching the fight happen like from the side a little more you really do see that like there's no cuts like they really kind of choreograph this like they're yeah. in it it's one take or any of that stuff it looks really um really really cool but i don't know i wanted to mention that because it, it really did kind of stand out to me like how much you got to sit back and watch some of this crazy fucking <laughs> <laughs> fighting happen <laughs> Well, I mean, it's all, and, and that's mixed in with those moments where then it goes to like a shot that's designed around a a, a gore shot, and it's like a lot of times those things yeah. happen so quick that I think that what you're talking about, Steve, almost like feeds into the effectiveness of some of those other quick cuts. Every now and then, like you how can jarring tell that can be! Someone's like standing so still, you can tell it's not a real guy. But sometimes, if it's edited yeah. just right, it really does surprise you. Like, oh shit, that guy got his head cut off. Yeah, um, or just yeah. lots of bad ways to die in this, you know? Yeah, yeah, um, so many. Um, but yeah, I'm Very glad cool. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. That was it was a, oh, fun, was a fun watch. One. Sure. No, good stuff, man. Good pick. Um so Steve, what's your pick? So uh my pick, I'm 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 turning a little bit here. Um this is a, a movie I don't know a ton about, except mm. for the fact that I love Bob Hoskins and it's always been one that's been on my radar that I've never quite gotten around to seeing. And also it was a bonus when I see that Helen Mirren is in it as well, and a very young Pierce Brosnan. Um, but this is like a mystery or not a mystery, like a crime drama thriller. It's again, it's always popped up on lists. I've been on my list forever and uh, just kind of scrolling through it the other day and seeing that it's available on Max Ooh. and the Criterion channel, which you mentioned about Shogun Assassin. Nice. Um, but this is 19. Uh, what is it? 1980. Yeah. 1980. Uh, the Long Good Friday. Uh, okay. This is again, Long Bob Hoskins. Nice. Real quick, an up-and-coming gangster is tested by the insurgents of an unknown, very powerful threat. It's available in Max, Helen Mirren, Bob Hoskins star, uh, John McKenzie directed by. Um, but, yep, this is my pick for this time, and I know nothing about it except for that IMDb log and that Bob Hoskins is the star of it. And, oh, and Bob Hoskins is great. He's great. I fucking like, I, I, I sort of forget he's been gone for a while. He hasn't, yeah. obviously, so there's no new shit. Um, but every time I see something he's in, uh, I'm like, God, that guy's so great. Even Ooh. if his American movies, he always basically did this guy. He always, yeah. <laughs> he always kind of did Eddie Valiant. Um, yeah. But I think it's fine. I mean, I think that like, I don't know. I think it's just some actors like that. You sort of forget. Oh, yeah, that's an actor doing a performance. And when you're a young person seeing movies, you don't really think about what it means to perform, to put forth that the sort of right. solid character, the kind of bluster. But there's a lot of heart. Um, really likable guy, and I, I, you know, I've seen him play harder edged people as well. So maybe that's what he's doing in this movie, 1980. That's a cool, uh, it's a cool era for all the people that you mentioned. So I can't wait to check this one out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and again, like 
it's just uh it's one of those things that always like you know mainly like you know thrillers or crime films like it's always somewhere <clears throat> in the list and i'm just like what is that one and i look at it and it's oh shit this is some you know pretty good cast um but yeah i like that it's available on max so you know not that i'm trying to promote them but it's a lot of people have that so right if you want to watch along with this one it's pretty easy and again it's also on the criterion channel if you uh if you grab Shogun Assassin off of that last week, you can you can find the long good Friday. Cool, 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 cool. There as well. So that, that's my pick for next week. Long good Friday. <clears throat> and moving on, let's go to Leave the World Behind. Mm. Mm. Um, I just want to say before we even talk about the film, I love Julia Roberts so much. I, I I don't say it enough, and I know I've said it before on the pod, mm -hmm. but I'm just taking a chance for we even talk about the movie or her in the movie or anything. I just feel like I've seen her popping up on some, you know, some podcasts I follow, some you know YouTube shows I listen to that she's been doing promotion for this. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Just love Julia Roberts. In case anybody forgot it, big fan. <laughs> you you know you know uh, that it's actually related to something. I love Mahershala Ali. I oh god yeah yeah he's, i fucking love that but, guy but he but he's a little but he but like that that's happening now I yeah feel it's like happening now a, we don't but, get a lot of julia roberts anymore but when they have there's a scene my favorite scene in this movie is their little the conversation together yep. where they're having yep. a drink and it's yep. like star power versus yep. star power and it's a little bit i mean i'm not suggesting anything about like i'm not even making any comment about any kind of gendered shit about women of a certain age and the roles yeah. they have i'm just talking about stars that age we've talked about it with tom cruise you know, we've talked about it with these kind of bankable names, these mm -hmm. young, fresh faces, how they handle becoming not so young, not so fresh faces. And I think that I don't know that I have a clear picture of where Julia Roberts uh, is in that. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, not in a bad way. I, you know, I don't know that she works as much as she she used to. Um, right. But I, I was thinking when I was watching this, like, oh, yeah, the last time I saw her in this kind of middle age, shall we say, kind of period of her career, um, it was what was that series and i looked it up and oh yeah it was homecoming and then homecoming, i looked and I, okay yeah. that's sam is male as well right like yeah, 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 yeah. That. so it made me think oh maybe there's some something there maybe there's some because she does have that sort of to say she has quiet power would be weird because she's such a kind of bright star but i mean if you just even if you don't aren't a fan if you just kind of observe the sort of phenomenon of her there yeah. is this there is this sort of uh i don't know there's something like in the in that scene where she says to Mahershala, Mahershala Ali's character, "Oh, I was a little prickly," and he was like, "Well, I was a little this." It's like I don't I know they're not talking about each other and themselves, but I was like, there is there is a vibe that Julia Roberts can convey that I don't think that anybody can quite do it the way that she can. Yeah, which is that sort of there's an there's a like a chill like she used to be like it was about the smile and the laugh, and I feel like now when she plays somebody, there's this. It's not like it's there's nothing going on, but it's like an almost impassive thing. You wonder what's going. There's a history to these character that she plays in this in this movie. I really think that scene was the one where I started to <clears throat> kind of view both of them more sympathetically than I had outside of that. And I really was enjoying watching. It's that kind of thing. I've talked about it a few times before. Probably it's just sometimes when it's just a star and a star, and they're just blasting star power at each other. I'm just so happy to be there. Like <laughs> I'm so happy I to know. be seeing that. And I know that's like that's like old Hollywood, whatever it is. But like you know, that made me think about. And yeah, Steve, you're right. He's an easier you know thing to 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 sort of quantify at the moment because he's hot at the you know he's having this kind of streak. But he yeah. still has been around for a few years and hasn't maybe quite. The I don't know, but he's won an Oscar. I mean, no, there's didn't he win for uh, Green Book or yeah? Oh, did he win for uh, Moonlight? Definitely Moonlight. Okay, so, I think he won for Green Book too. Oh shoot, that's too. Okay. He, I, he, he, I think he didn't he win back to back years. Damn. Let and not to bring Marvel into this, but how did they hire him and then keep him on ice for like five years? What the fuck? You I don't know. know. Like, I don't understand that on any level. Yeah, he yeah. won in 2017 for Moonlight and 2019 for Green Book. Whoa. He's got two Oscar wins. Well, he's that good. But anyway, he's like, incredible. Yeah. He, I mean, the he, moment he walks into this yeah. movie, it's just they open that door. You're like, oh, yep, yeah. that's a fucking star. Mm -hmm. And we talk about that on this podcast a lot. Like just that idea of like stars. Yeah. And honestly, like you can make an argument, even Ethan Hawke, even mm. Kevin Bacon and, you know, rolling oh, in there for that yeah. huge scene. You're like, that's a movie star. I mean, it's a movie star. And I'm not trying to be subjective. Like that's a my my age or my you know, my generation or whatever. But I mean, just like 
that presence, like, you know, you're talking about Julia, you're talking about Mahershala, you know, you got Ethan Hawke and he's great got, in this. Even that sequence with Ethan Hawke, Mahershala and Kevin Bacon, that like three handed, like that whole tense scene. Oh my like, God. you're just like, this works because these people are like amazing at what they do. And they're yeah. like serious about it. And we know how yeah. we know Ethan Hawke doesn't take a role lightly. I mean, you know, we yeah. hear him talk about what he chooses apart. So yeah. like he was he was doing that thing where he's kind of playing against yeah, the charm was, of yeah. his character, like the kind of thing that we've seen um, uh, Paul Rudd do a couple of times where he's playing kind of an obnoxious character. And it's like he takes he toxicifies the thing that would make him appealing. And I think yeah, the fact yeah, that yeah. Ethan Hawke's character in this is like a, a cool college professor. I mean, it's just the perfect image of this guy. But if you notice, he's kind of I don't know. I was really watching his character for like what he does in the scene. And he's kind of. He's kind of a he kind of is a nothing. I don't know. There's something interesting about the sort of affable middle aged guy that's just trying not to step on toes and like, oh, sure, come on in. You know, and he's but he's not really making a, a stand for anything in in the movie. And his, he never really does anything heroic. Um, so I think that's an interesting role for someone like Ethan Ethan Hawke to come in. I was about to call him yeah. Ethan Hunt. Um, <laughs> if he ripped off the mask at one point, and it was Tom Cruise. But no, I, I just wanted to underline what you said, Steve. Yeah, we can't ignore him just because he's not doing as showy or maybe as centered as a as a part. I think what he does in this movie is impressive, um, impressive as well. So yeah, it was. Uh, uh, you know, I, I I'll just say that like there was there were points in this movie where I thought, oh, I think I love this movie, and then as it ended, I was like, oh, I don't know that I love loved it but I loved parts of it a lot. And I think that like the, the kind of, I liked the sort of almost hangout vibe of it. The fact that it was a sort of dystopian from a distance, not too different from something that M night Shyamalan might try to do. But yeah, like Shyamalan -ish. But, 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 a, but a softer version, so much softer that I wonder if maybe the quote unquote twist should have just been made part of the story earlier because it felt weird after all the, the really interesting stuff was the human interaction. It was weird that the last, you know, act tried to lead up to this kind of reveal moment that to me didn't feel like the payoff of the movie. The payoff yeah. to me was much more about the characters and what they were going through than it was like sort of finding out what was happening. But I liked yep. the peripheral nature of the story. I liked how much the people were on. It was, I've, I've, I'm sure we've all had that thought, right? Have you ever gone on vacation and had the thought of like, of oh, like yeah. how if you were in a remote place when something happened, <sighs> would you want to just stay in the remote place? Would you try to get yeah. back to the world? I don't know. It, I, I think yeah. the movie played on some really you know, real fears, but also this idea that you're doing this insanely privileged thing. Yeah. When the world's right. going to shit, you know, it's a pretty interesting project. It's an adaptation of a book that was, that came out in 2020. Um, Luman Alam did it. And this is adapted by Sam and supervised and produced by Barack Obama. Who, and Michelle. Yeah. Did and you Michelle. See that produced by I, that, who, that was, I was like, well, who was who was advising on the scale of how this could really go down and apparently scared the shit out of Sam as he was like, this would actually be a little crazier than this. This would yeah. this would escalate. And, the, and, and honestly, the conclusion that it came to is one that I've said to people for years. There's no cabal. There's a, it's access. Access is the scariest thing in the world. The fact right. that when, I mean, you may have had these, these experiences too, where like even something like COVID when that occurred, finding out who had access to things and who didn't have access to things. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, vaccine places that were like mm -hmm. unsanctioned. And yeah, you know, I, I found out about a bunch of that stuff. And what, and what, it, what, it, what it made me realize is it's just a resource game. Mm -hmm. When this shit all comes down, it's really a matter of who has access to the information first um, and how they adapt to it and the things that they do to maintain their sense of peace while this stuff is happening is the spookiest shit in the world. And I can say the first hand that I've had experience with some of it and just seeing it happen, even just working in D.C., and having access to information before the general public does. Just like, oh man, mm -hmm. a whisper in the ear. Something's going down next week. This might get a little crazy next week. This could have, that's the lead time that could save your life. And that that kind of stuff is, is petrifying. And it really touches on that stuff. And that's all Mahershal Ali's character was kind of talking about. Just mm -hmm. like access to information. Yeah, And he was, you know, privy <clears throat> to a ton of moving parts that could lead to something. And he's, you know, he has the information to kind of, you know, predict some things, the curve, as he talked yeah, about, which yeah. I think is 
pretty fascinating. And the fact that they put it in a character's hands like him, um, who Julia Roberts obviously still had some doubt about in the beginnings, mm-hmm. which I, I really loved. I mean, because like, I think we have well, a she's lot of- too hard edged, but Ethan Hawk, Ethan Hawk is too ready to just say, he come on in and, and be like the nice guy. And like this, you could be getting this in deeper. So you see how maybe she's the way she is. Yeah. It almost reminded me, you know, I just thought of this, the, the uh, Connie Britton and uh, Steve Zahn couple on the first season of white Lotus had a similar mm-hmm. vibe. It's like, he's mm-hmm. the sort of more likable one, but he's also kind of the putts <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> of the yeah, two yeah. of them. And I think a lot of, uh, maybe a lot of male female relationships uh, work that way where like the, dude might be charming but you know he's he's a mess and there's definitely someone whose nerves can wear thin with somebody like that and so i found that was kind of fun like they didn't overdo it like their marriage isn't in tatters in the movie but you yeah. definitely feel her hard edgedness is almost in reaction to his softness you know his lack of action and and not to like you know we've been talking about these these leads man the kids uh malayla harold um, who um, is in industry on HBO? Okay, I wonder, um, I wonder what I recognize. Her Farrah McKenzie, who plays Rosie, and Charlie Evans, that plays Archie. These these guys are killing it. I mean, you know, varying ages, um, varying perspectives on what's going on, um, but they are not sleepers either. Like they they were all incredible, and seeing them all kind. of... <laughs> You know what really made this feel different is I think Sam kind of wrote this almost like a play. It's it feels like, like <clears throat> I was gonna say it felt yeah. like a play. Yeah, you see these like characters kind of go in pairs, like you yep. know that they're in a room with each other, and then they have these these like intense conversations about you know feelings and class and you know. I I think it was beautiful, and and even though it it, it seemed like there were scenes that were a little off of this off of the area they still pl- felt like the play like plays like s- scenes from plays from the 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 three person scene that you you get you you were getting at uh John to even just Ethan driving down the street and seeing that woman on the side of the road that felt very much like a play like it was it hurt my feelings to be completely honest with you well, I mean, I was waiting for him to do something unforgivable. I was just like, this this nice guy <laughs> yeah. is going to probably you always ex- expect him now to let you yeah. know when you see this sort of he seems like the 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 reasonable one or whatever that he's going to yeah. be the one who does the worst thing. And then at, at the end of the movie, I was like, I think he might maybe he is still the person who ends up with the worst worst you know kind of crime because mm. it seems like you could have tried harder to understand what was going on. But I did believe the moment of frustration and just like, fuck, fuck, fuck. I just got to get out of here. Yeah, I, yeah, I didn't intend sure. to stop and get caught in whatever this is, but it ends yeah. up being like a real act of cowardice, you know? Yeah. Um, and he's, genu- he's, he's also like just genuinely lost too. Yeah, like he has yeah. no he's, idea what's uh, going on. Which we find out later that he was literally lost. Like at the moment, yeah. We, yeah. I, th- I thought maybe he did that thing that I do sometimes if I'm in a new place where I was like, I'll make myself lost. You know, I'll just drive yeah. around yeah. And, and kind of find my way back. But he confessed later that he was literally, you know, he couldn't find his way back. Um, I wanted to say, I'll make sure I was getting the right actress's name, but you mentioned her, Malayla Harold. Yeah, she was an interesting character, Ruth, because she had that prickliness too. And you almost wanted her to chill out a little bit, even if she had like a good point. Yeah, but yeah. like her her whole thing about it's our house is like that's a good point. But these people did rent the house, so it's sure. like I guess what I'm saying is I like how even she and her kind of righteous anger and a lot of things that were going on, even she didn't have like a perfect case. It's another case of all the characters being kind of interesting and not you know not as simple as could be. That like you kind of agree with her point, but she was being so aggro about it that sure. it's like that it's like you could see how her dad i mean again as a parent of a of a of a you know young person you can sometimes as a parent be like come on you know yeah. you don't have to but do that but you can also see how the way that julia roberts was acting was causing uh ruth to to be like you know i guess yeah. we're kind of speaking in code we should just say that the broad stroke of this movie is these this family decides to take a little last minute getaway to a place out in the country and then kind of all hell breaks loose in the world yeah. and then the people that own the house that they rented show up and kind of want to share the space while they hunker down and so yeah. what i mentioned before about it being this insanely privileged thing to be doing i do think that's something i think about whenever i try to come up with a story or i'm writing it's like are these privileged people with privileged problems mm. um, and i think it's interesting to have people who are experiencing all this like this thing that should connect them to the world but they're yeah. off in a little fantasy world while yeah. this is happening you know so so that seems sure. like it has a thematic angle to it 
I think I think one of the things you were kind of getting at there, uh, like I think you mentioned it a little bit before about in terms of uh, what is their characters' names? Julia Rock, Amanda, and Ruth, and then G H and Clay. I feel like through the movie, like you see all the different mixing of the you know the pairings of these characters, but yeah. I think in the final act of the movie, the you know I think Amanda and Ruth being together. Like that scene out in that shack oh. with the two of them. That's a that's an incredible scene, mm-hmm. especially you know, and, and especially like when Amanda's kind of going off about us as people and what we're doing and not doing, right. and you know, you 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 just wait for Ruth to have to say something, and she's like, I have I basically agree with everything you said. <laughs> yeah, like the fact that those two characters that really have so much in common that have been clashed this entire time yeah. are together in a moment that they kind of agree on something and then a, a scene happens after that where they really are helping one another for the mm-hmm. first time yeah. in the movie and then you see the kind of same thing with clay and gh where like they're the two that are kind of like the peacemakers of this whole thing trying to kind of keep the conversation moving and not be com- combative or confrontational and they end up actually in the real confrontation you know i i, I really liked that pacing and like that kind of narrative structure that you know, they were both kind of forced into their own confrontations where it kind of brought the characters together and you kind of kind of saw yeah, the, the bonding of those characters, like, you know, not based sure. on only the similarities, but in, in, in ways in which they were different and kind of how they could ultimately complement one another. So yeah. I, I really thought that those scenes really played out nicely because of that. And uh, and we mentioned Kevin Bacon, but like, you know, seeing yeah. him for a hot second earlier in the movie and being like, where's Kevin Bacon? Yeah. And then he gets this like, amazing sequence towards the yeah. end um i thought was <clears throat> really great i mean yeah, i i kind of i kind of feel like i i really did kind of love this movie i mean the me more too. it sat with me i was like a very good great kind of feeling coming out mm-hmm. of it um but the more it sits with me and i think about the things that we just kind of went down just now in this episode like it really has stuck with me a bit and i mean even mm-hmm. even talking briefly about watching the you know the news that civil war trailer you know, kind of this, you know, end of the world kind of scenario or this like, civil war in the United States, what that looked like. But just the way that that's kind of framed or, or the take on that in this film. I mean, obviously, it's it's frightening and it's yeah. so it's so scary. It's it, it it's real kind of thing. But um, yeah, I, I one, one funny thing I was thinking about while watching it was like uh, the daughter. Uh, what was her name? Rose. The whole sh- the whole movie, like she's obsessed with uh, watching Friends and like yeah. getting through Friends, and I wonder, you know, when she got through the episode that Julia Roberts was in, was she like Julia Roberts looks like you, Mom? <laughs> yeah. I wonder if that happened, you know, right, right, right. <laughs> in the moment. That's so <laughs> it's like, it was like Julia Roberts was on Friends. That's an interesting pick of a show to watch. That, that uh, commentary about <laughs> being nostalgic for a time that never existed. Yeah. That's I've always felt that way yeah, about yeah, that yeah. show, and no, and it's no offense. Like I, I think that like it has a place. Um, it has a place, and I like that people have escapisms like that. Sure, and and I think I think this movie, as as crazy as it is, really does have like a. I, I have this saying that I've been saying like the last like five years: love is a north star. It always should be. I'm mean, you know even even if it feels weird. <sighs> You know, even if it, even if you're helping somebody that isn't necessarily being the nicest to you in the to- at the time, mm-hmm. love should always be the North Star. And it, and it feels like this movie kind of maintains that even throughout all of this stuff, Mahershala and and kind of being the the like strongest version of that at first. Yeah, but then you see it in everybody. You see strong versions of it in everybody he's he's just the first to express it in the way that he does but um when he stops i don't know man it made me really emotional when he like was like stood his ground when he he wouldn't leave like you know he 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 really was like this is fucking crazy this Mm -hmm. you gotta but but then the piece that kind of came afterwards and how friendly you know he was after that like having this conversation with the shotgun kind of yeah. In his lap, kind of talking about, I, you know, it's 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 weird, but I don't know. I it, it made me feel really hopeful. No, I do think hopeful. it ended up being a non bleak movie, but that doesn't mean that, like, it still ended in a kind of 
upsetting way, but it didn't. Oh, yeah. it, you're right that the characters are not alone. Yeah, when they're yeah, going through sure. something, and except for the, the 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 kids, they're kind of off by themselves. The 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 kids of uh, Amanda and Clay. But um, yeah, I think the whole thing about friends, I always appreciate when when shows and movies and when when they're honest about the role that pop culture has in people's lives, you know. Um, yeah. And I don't think it mattered that it was friends. I mean, I think for this girl and this, maybe the fact that it's, uh, uh, you know, the access to the footage and maybe a moment in our culture, but like just seeing the DVD menu and you saw the wall of DVDs that were there in yeah. that place. Like um, you, you, if, if you looked, you probably saw a bunch of shows that you recognized and maybe you yeah. loved. So I think there's an interesting note there that it doesn't, I mean, yes, it's friends and maybe it's relevant that it's a young person who's watching friends now. And like you said, Ronald, a kind of weird wistful nostalgia for something that, you lived through that time you know that was a it never was a the real world you know yeah um but i think even beyond that just that idea that a pop cultural thing would sit with you and the idea that you're in the middle of the apocalypse and you may never see the end of a show that you were curious <laughs> about i think that is a notion that you could apply to almost anything <laughs> and say that would i don't know it was just i, I liked that that it played with that notion yeah, of like yeah, just sure. the you know that they actually spelled it out and i i thought it was really interesting that her brother he has like three or four moments in the movie where he has a good chance to like say something kind of sweet and supportive and instead he just goes full on big brother asshole sibling kind of yeah. like you know saying the opposite of the thing she wants to hear you know he he, yeah. he could she's like hinting around about not knowing how friends ends and he he could talk he probably knows and could totally tell her but instead what he says <laughs> is yeah well you probably should just get used to not caring about that shit or whatever he says you know but it's like it's it's interesting that the those two don't really connect in the way that you might expect them to in a movie but yeah. they are still a you know brother and sister and there's earlier in the movie you can tell there's you know there's a concern yeah. um yeah, but sure. no i yeah i liked the um i liked the way that 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 role of pop culture was addressed by by her sort of obsession because you know you'd be feeling that way. There's some yes. part of you, if you weren't running for your life, some part of you would be like, "Shit, I didn't even find out what happened on, <laughs> you know, on Fargo season five. <clears throat> yes, <laughs> gotta watch it immediately. <sighs> yeah, um, but I mean, overall, yeah, I really dug this one. Me I'm too, like man. No, I'm, I'm glad we decided to watch it because it was like I kept popping up on my Netflix and I would see a little bit of the trailer or whatever clip they showed. And it was mm -hmm. just like the sort of juxtaposition of something going wrong in the world and they're driving down the road and she's like, oh, there's a Starbucks. And he's like, oh, you know, yeah. it, it's just the perfect <laughs> kind of it's the kind of perfect nothing moment. But it says so much about the kind of almost like aimless lives these yeah. people are living. Uh, right, so right. true. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, bits and bobs. That's what we call this now, right? Mm -hmm. I like it. Yeah, let's go. What else have you guys watched? What else have you seen? Steve, Bron. Man, have I watched anything? I don't I mean, besides the shows I've been keeping up on, uh, that I mentioned a, a few of them last week, but what's uh, what, it, the um the Batman Christmas thing? What is that called, Ronald? Uh a very uh, very batty Chris or something like that. Uh, how was that? I, I really liked it. It was really I good. See it. How's he? How, how did your brain adjust to the animation stuff? It, it looks, was a little jarring. It, at first. it was a little jarring at first, but okay. like 10, I don't know, 10 seconds, whatever. Okay. It didn't you know, take I'm, very I'm, long. I'm trying to look, I'm trying to look and see what it was. It was a merry, merry little Batman. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that was a Warner brother animation thing that i watched now now shouldn't you if you were going to do a batman christmas theme thing we know what it should be called right what should it be called jingle bells batman smells yes <laughs> that would be a perfect name bro. robin laid an egg did you, did that exist when you guys were kids <laughs> this, this yes. i guess i guess i guess they go with Mary batman little smells. Batman robin robin because because it's more one? about it's more about, it's, it's about damien is real you know? yeah. her got away but so know, was Ron, it good? Did you like it? It's fine. Yeah, uh, I watched it I with my daughter. Uh, it was. It was. Yeah, it was like a what? What's new? What's out? And uh, I, I, yeah, it's 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 really fun. I, and I really like the voice cast too. I had no idea who the voice cast was. Watched like when I when I when I put it on, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, loading it up and kind of reading about it, you know, it was like Luke Wilson as Batman, Bruce Wayne uh james james cromwell is like alfred like i can't remember who else was in it but it was a it was a pretty fun cast who was um somebody else stood out um oh man i can't remember who it was 
but yeah, it's it was cute. Like it was fun. Um, I I like a lot of that Warner Brothers animation stuff, like the Batman DC stuff. It's it's yeah, pretty too. fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what else? I don't think I saw really any other movies, man. Um, what about you guys? Have you watched anything else? Um, I watched the Kevin Hart Chris Rock documentary, Headliners Only. Hmm. What is um, that? I thought I couldn't so tell what that is, was. It I thought it was like just, a special. Of the yeah, two of them. it is just a documentary um, okay. about basically about their individual lives and how they intersect. Um, it touches a little more on um, Kevin Hart losing his mom um, mm. right when he started comedy. And um, it kind of created a drive for him. Um, it You know, it's a bunch of really emotional stories. His brother's in it. And then also Chris Rock's brothers in it, and <laughs> I Chris I, I've met Tony Rock a couple of times, just kind of oh, cool. in Baltimore, and his and his little brother, um, but I've met I've met them Jingle both. Bell Rock, and so Jingle Bell Rock. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> it's a theme. <laughs> yeah. But there's a really cool scene, and I don't want to give it away. Chris Rock and Tony Rock both are comedians. Tony has never every time that Chris Rock gets asked a question from Tony related to the industry, Chris Rock has said no to him. There's one question that Tony asks of him that gets granted that is so fucking cool that, if, you know, it, it's all in the context of everything happening in the story. It's so fun. Um, and seeing the connection between Chris Rock and Kevin Hart's really cool because Kevin Hart's kind of on a newer generation than, than Chris. And he's kind of come along and helped him along the way. Um, kind of showing up in Real Housewives of a Real House Husbands of Hollywood and stuff like that. Yeah. But it's really cool. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, it's it's a fun movie. And then I'm watching the MCU movies in chronological story order. Ooh, I think you mentioned uh, that. And I'm in, I'm at uh just finished Doctor <laughs> Strange. I'm on uh Black Panther. Man, this is the heyday. It's really cool to see how everything's kind of falling apart. Uh, not <laughs> not cool at all, but you know, there's like a like I'm I'm ramping up, I'm ramping up for you know the two Avengers movies, and my brain is like, holy fuck! Like I didn't, I, you know, I, I I admittedly didn't love the first one, but the second one, the second one was cinematic crazy. You know, it, I just remember people screaming when we watched that in the movies. Like, it was like, it was special. I'm excited about getting to that point. But I'm nice. I'm now at Black Panther. Uh, but those that's essentially what I've been watching. What about you, John? What have you been? Well, I, we'll do this since I saw a movie that you guys haven't seen. Okay. We could do this like in a Q&A format. You can ask okay. me about Wonka. Ask me about Wonka. Did you like it? I guess that's what... <laughs> I thought you were about to say something, Steve. That, that, don't read into that pause. Um, uh, Hugh Grant is very funny as an Oompa Loompa. Um, the movie is like full of little charming moments okay. and turns from like British actors. That, okay. But, but the and and Timothy Chalamet, if you've shown up for any of his movies, you know he doesn't like not try. Mm, mm, mm. And he's he's all about it. And he's actually like he somehow manages not to embarrass himself, even when he's doing some pretty silly stuff in this movie which is a straight up musical i mean i'm I maybe maybe people are aware of that but the i don't remember the marketing for me i was not it, aware of that oh it, it is a full-on musical you know wow. with like disney style opening with a song of a person arriving in a town and all that stuff yeah and the songs are sort of like jaunty and kind of dun, 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 you know like catchy in a way when you're listening to them but they kind of fall out of your brain like i think it's the, the guy who wrote the songs neil hannon is uh the guy um the songwriter for the group divine <clears throat> the divine comedy i don't know if you know that group um yeah. it's a british group from the got started in the late 80s okay and uh probably in the late 90s kind of hit on a style that then was popular through the early 2000s but neil hannon has written a lot of stuff for movies and television um uh, or, or at least for television, I believe. And he's also um, just a very funny, I mean, it's it's not quite like uh, 
like theater music or 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 music that's intended like it still fits within the realm of kind of pop but his mm. earlier stuff or mid mid period there that late 90s stuff was very theatrical um elaborate pop songs that had a kind of sounded like they were from musical mm. so it's a good fit but i hate to say like his songs just kind of they they feel okay but they're not they're not bad they're not great um mm. and then when you get to the, the end of the movie and you walk out the two songs that are stuck in your brain are Oompa loompa loompa <laughs> and uh, uh, pure imagination, which are the you know from the 1974 uh, uh, Gene Wilder movie, or yeah. was that 74 or 71 or 72? Anyway, um, the one from the you know, which is the, sort of the one to beat. Uh, Timothy Chalamet is not doing Gene Wilder, he's definitely not doing Johnny Depp from, from the Tim Burton version. Um, this movie kind of positions itself as like an alternate world. Like you can kind of see it being adjacent to the Gene Wilder version. This feels like it's taking place in, in England. Whereas I think the American film felt like it was taking place in a kind of any town America. Um, anyway, I, you know, I, I think, I think there's a lot to like here and it's, it's, it's cute, but there is something kind of flat about it that it's hard hmm. to put my finger on that I would be, I'll be curious to see what you think once you've seen it, because I do think there's a lot of stuff that, like I said, every time I thought, Oh, but this is just not working for me. Like there's some emotional content that I didn't think it was badly acted or badly shot or badly written. But what if you're thinking about it and you're not feeling it and you realize you should be like, right. you know, these types of movies are supposed to, if they're going for the tears, they should, they should make, they should go for the tears. They shouldn't be like, this is that part where you get sad and you don't really feel it. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, you know, the fact that Paul King is the guy behind the Paddington films. Um, and you might say, is there any sign of that in this? And I do think there's plenty of signs of that kind of style against which the, the quirky and, and whimsy ele whimsical elements are balanced. And, and Wonka is full on, like everything in this world is twisted and kind of whimsical, um, which makes it feel very much like Roald Dahl's prose but it also doesn't give you a lot to hold on to uh, in terms of, you know, just what's what to care about in this world. I will say I kind of like that this is sort of a low stakes story and that it's not like trying to be the biggest blockbuster in the world. Um, mm. So like I said, I think I'm kind of charmed by certain aspects of it. And I really do think, oh, talking to someone else that's seen it would probably help me come to terms with where this movie kind of sits for me. But there, there's some point at which I was like, I should be delighted and, and I'm just not like it didn't give me those highs yeah. of like a Paddington movie, um, even if you can feel it kind of reaching for that sort of tone. So yeah. um, that was all. What did you say? Did I like it? <laughs> it sounds like it sounds like you like it. You, for the did most you part. like it? Yeah. yeah. I think again, like I said, I think I liked it, but I'm kind of curious as to why it didn't click. Be Like why I didn't just walk out of it with a big old smile on my face. Right, right, you know? right. Yeah, I'm curious to see how that uh, performs at box office. It's it's very odd to me. It's a Warner Brothers, right? I think. Yeah, it's kind of it's it's so crazy to me that Warner Brothers has like that, the Color Purple, and Aquaman, and and moved Dune to next year. Like it's a weird run of th of like three movies that I think may maybe may all underperform at the box office and mm. you know to move the one that probably would have overperformed because of the premium large format especially like it's just, it's just uh, yeah i'm very curious to see how these movies do i've heard the color purple is great i can't wait to see that yeah. but i i do want to see wonka i'm not that interested in seeing aquaman too i probably will just out of a you know the hate watch i gotta finish i gotta finish the dceu out <laughs> this is the last um, one right yeah well, okay. apparently, yeah. Yeah, there, there, and the, any, like any connectivity previous, to it, yeah. yeah. I mean, is there any world where that movie's such a huge hit that they have to consider whether they would do another Jason Momoa? I don't, I don't think so, man. No. I mean, I, I feel like it's already kind of underperforming on a global kind of where it's already opened, um, and like previews and stuff like that they use for tracking. It's, it's very much underperforming. But I feel like it's kind of just been like left to die. I mean, there really isn't some crazy marketing campaign for it uh i think of the three it feels like wonka was the one they really kind of put some marketing behind you know which does feel like that could be a breakout if it if it, mm -hmm. if it you know i think that could probably maybe overperform if it connects but i don't know we'll see anything else you guys want to mention i think that's it for me 
Yeah, I gotta. I want to get to like you, you would. Mex- you had messaged us on our thread earlier, like you know, what are the awards movies we need to see, or like top yeah. ten possible movies. And I'm just like looking through my list. It's there's a bunch of them that are still theatrical that I either I it's a kind of limited thing or it's you know I don't yeah. know what the window is for it to come at to come home digitally or anything like that. But I think it's gonna be a few weeks before I really see the ones that I would you know either have an interest in or that I think could maybe make a run first spot in my top 10 but uh i know i the the holdovers specifically that's available digitally i need to watch that i I wanted to start that yesterday i just didn't have time that's probably the next thing i'm gonna see and i'm gonna see the boy in the heron um i i I probably would have seen that today instead of wonka if i could have made it but timing wise it just didn't work out but i was pleased to to see something new um yeah as quick as possible since we were recording this cool but uh, yeah, so what is that? Let's, let's reiterate. We're going to watch uh, for required viewing next time. We're watching The Long Good Friday. Is that what it was called? That's right. All right. Yeah. I'm excited. And again, it's that's, on Max. Max that's our Christmas episode. Time. So that'll be uh, Merry Christmas to, to us, to us from you, <laughs> but from us to you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, where is where are the Christmas presents from, from them to us, Steve? Why, why do the fans not send us presents? Uh, they must be good. Uh, you know, Postal Service is having a lot of issues recently. Yeah, that's true. It's true. Delay, delay, delay. I don't know. It's hard out. I'm holding out hope, guys. <clears throat> Moviesmovie.com is the website. Um, YouTube.com slash Movie Podcast if you want to go for the video element. But yeah, Moviesmovie.com if you want to jump into any of the podcast platforms that you may prefer. Um, we're pretty much everywhere. Or you can listen right on that site. And if you do subscribe or you just kind of come along and listen to episodes here and there, thank you either way. Um, if you have an opportunity to leave a review or a rating or any kind of thing that might help somebody else find us, uh, you could even share an episode with a friend that you maybe think is relevant. Maybe you know somebody that you know is looking forward to seeing Wonka this weekend. You should let them know that we just talked about it on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> um, try to stay timely on that thing. But uh, we'd appreciate it, and uh, thank you in advance for that. But uh, that's going to wrap up this episode. And as always, you've made our day. Thanks. <laughs>